everybody, Robert Vandervoort here with iDera Software, and today we're going to be walking through a fresh install of Uptime Infrastructure Monitor 772. So some things I'm going to take for granted is that you're going to be installing on a supported monitoring station platform. You can find those by going to docs.uptimesoftware.com, heading on over to the Uptime 77 documentation latest product documentation and scrolling down the screen for which you will find the available versions that we support for not only Windows Server but also Zuza and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Alright, now dispensing with that, we want to make sure that we install it on a machine that is fairly well provisioned. It doesn't have to be a supercomputer for a trial, of course. <laughs> uh, I have about four, exactly four cores on this guy, 2.5 gigahertz, I got 12 gigs of RAM available, of which we probably are not going to come quite close to using that. Um, but, you know, of course, we will think about production versus test environments and so on. Other thing that's important to note is your trial license is good for 50 hosts for monitoring. If you need to monitor more than that in a trial, make sure you get in touch with your account manager so they can cut you an appropriately sized key. All right, without further ado, then let's get at it. We want to download our install source here. They're all 64-bit, so we just download Windows or Red Hat or whatever you're going to do. Uh, again, this is just for the Windows install. Right-click on it and do Run as Administrator. Whether you are a local administrator or not, you will want to do Run as Administrator, so we make sure we have all the permissions that we need in order to do everything we need to do. This process can take several minutes, so sit back and relax, and after this screen goes away, all screens will disappear a couple minutes later, will be greeted with our splash screen for the install. All right, now let's walk through the install wizard. It's a bunch of next and check boxes. I just, uh, for this, I usually like to install to uptime. I think it just makes things a little simpler. I generally would advise picking thousand elements here. It allows the database engine to stretch its legs a little bit more than the 200 element setting does. And these requirements are really more of a recommendation than anything else. Data store folder, this is where we're going to stick our database files themselves. For most trials, you know, everything on one drive is fine. And when we're getting into the very large deployments where, you know, best practice for a database is to split those database files off onto a separate drive, so long as it's actually a separate drive and not just another VHD on the same spinning hardware, generally, uh, that's what we could do. But for this, we'll just leave it to the defaults. Web server, this is going to be just the local host here, so if for some reason that's wrong, you can change it, but this should be fine. I generally would also advise changing that web server port to port 80, especially if this server is dedicated just for uptime. We're not going to be conflicting with anything else, so 80 should be just fine. Prevents you from having to put a port in the URL. For a controller port and distinguished name, you shouldn't have to change these at all. The passphrase here is simply for encrypting our uh, API communication, so you can put whatever you like. Just make sure you put the same thing in both boxes. Program folder, uptime, anybody, next, and next. And sit back and wait. All right, now launch uptime in a browser is selected when we hit finish it will pop open your default browser and it's going to jump us into our auto discovery wizard so this is a point where you want to have that license key handy that you got via email and also on the screen when you went to go download uptime if you don't have the license key then you can reach out to your account rep or there's going to be a spot here in just a second where it gives you information on how to get one so here i'm just going to fill out my information Pick a password and email, and you can put in your email server here for outgoing SMTP email. I'll just leave this alone, but uh, you'll you'll want to put in a SMTP. That will also give you all the alerts and stuff. So as far as uptime, being able to send out alerts, that'll set that up for you. All right, here's where our license key goes. All right, now the next screen we're presented with global credential settings. So what these are for, these are for discovery and monitoring. So instead of having to enter in credentials every single time we run a discovery, this will save these credentials for future use. So uptime agent default the port is 9998. So generally just say, cool, just keep it that way. 
SSL is going to give you the ability to use encryption between your agent and monitoring station. I'm not going to cover that in this particular run through, but you know, understand there is documentation on docs.uptimesoftware.com. All right, so service using WMI, we're going to need to use an account who is a local administrator on the machines you're trying to monitor. So for me, uh, while I do have a lot of machines that are domain join, it's pretty half and half in my environment. So I'm going to skip the domain and just use the local administrator account. Now again, you can use any local administrator account for WMI, or you can configure DCOM and WMI management on each and every server or through group policy to be able to use an account who is not a local administrator. But I'm not going to, again, not going to cover that in this demo. All right, SNMP global credentials are going to be uh, mostly v2 in my environment. So I'll go ahead and put in my public string, which is uptime pub. And it is pingable. And for v3, I can go ahead and put in the credentials. I'm not going to go ahead and find anything right now with it. But just to show you what this looks like, if uh, for those who may not be very familiar with SNMP v3, it is a little bit more secure, affords us a few more options as far as what we can restrict view wise and, and so on. And um, basically this is if you see if you have a SNMP with what is known as auth priv, this is authentication auth, this is the priv. So MD5 and DES is pretty much the, the, the common standard for that. But if it doesn't work for some reason, just check with your network administrator or with the device configuration. This also assumes obviously that you have SNMP enabled on the devices that we're going to be adding. All right, and that's it from the global credentials. Go ahead and hit next here. And then the next thing is, what are we looking for? All right, in this case, we're gonna look for anything that has an agent running on it. Now, understandable, if this is a first time install for you, you haven't installed any agents, you're not gonna find anything. But I'm gonna do this just so you can see what that looks like when we do. I'm using my global credentials. WMI, same deal, just select that. Network devices, same deal there. The device is using net SNMP. What this is about, we use the same credentials that we stored before, though net SNMP is actually a library and is typically used on servers. So when we talk about whether something is agent or agentlessly monitored, this is typically going to be agentless monitoring for our Linuxes, our Suns, our you know, HPUX or our Mac OS X or something like that that we don't want to use an agent on. But the agents do afford you a little bit more insight um, into some individual OS metrics as well as the ability to run scripts locally on those machines. So if you have those goals in mind, then agents are probably the way to go. If NetSMP is the only thing offered and it's not something we can install an agent on, which is understandable in many situations, then that's where we're going to use this. I mention this because this is not routers and switches. This is NetSMP, not network devices. So that's why we have that kind of highlighted in a way, right? All right, anyway, VMware. So yes, we do want to discover VMware. How are we going to discover VMware? This is going through port 443. Know that if you have other things listening to 443, they may show up as credential errors. Now this is going to be the vSphere credentials. Because when we add VMware, we're actually adding it through vSphere within this wizard. Now we do have the ability to add ESX host individually, but for the sake of this particular wizard, this is talking about vSphere. So you may have some credential errors on your ESX host when we do find them inevitably. All right, we're adding it to my infrastructure, it's fine. Um, if you're discovering P-Series through the hardware management console on your IBM stuff, this is how we would do that. Uh, there's a whole procedure for doing that as well as monitoring the individual LPARs with agents. I would point you out to docs.uptimesoftware for that and just do a search for P-Series or for HMC and you should find that document. All right, for the sake of this demo, we are ready to go. Let's go ahead and hit next here. And we're going to be asked our search scope. Now, it's very well defined what exactly you can enter in this box right underneath the box. For this case, I'm going to be doing a few different subnets here. So 10.1.40 contains my vCenter um, and as well as all of the Windows servers and agent-based servers and so forth. I'm also going to do a network port range. So 10.1.7. Dot one through six is gonna get me those guys. And I'll just keep it limited for the sake of the demo here. I should find a great deal of stuff all by itself. Now the first stage of discovery is finding out who is listening. So if we open up our unknown group, 
you're going to see the first thing that goes on is actually essentially a port scan ping sweep, right? So who is up and listening? What does their IP resolve to? So we're going to do the whole IP to hostname resolution bit. All right, and then when this is finished, we're actually going to try to use the credentials that we provided in the prior steps in the methods that we selected. All right, now that the wizard's finished, you can see all the devices that it found it categorized into how we connected to them. So there's very little left in the unknown section. So let's just go ahead and go through the results real quick. So under WMI agent list, looks like we've got a few that actually failed credentials wise, which I expected. Uh, using the local administrator account does not work on every server because domain controllers and any other servers that might have a different account password or something like that, right? So we can come up here to the filter and show only the devices with errors, which makes it a lot faster to get this stood up again. So, you know, in here we can just click on failed credentials error and then uptime is going to bring up a pop-up window where we can add different credentials to try to connect to that server again prior to proceeding. So that's gonna make this whole process a little bit more streamlined. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and use my uptimedemo.com domain and then plug that in, boom. All right, cool. So I'll go ahead and do these for these five. Now this is not a big deal to do on five. Of course, if you have several dozen or if your domain is kind of half and half on and off domain, you probably wanna just do one scan for the domain joined ones and a separate scan later on for the non-domain joint ones. It's gonna definitely result in a lot less effort on your part. And that's what we're trying to do with this discovery wizard. It's really reduce the amount of effort that this takes. Once we fix the credential errors, go ahead and flip the filter back. And then I wanna add all of these, so I can just go ahead and select the group. And I'll scrunch it down and move on to the next one. So it's agents. Um, now, so Apache 03 is actually getting decommissioned. And understand, anything that we add through this wizard is going to take away from our license count. Now, my license count's good for 1,000. And, of course, like I said, if you need to have more than 50, just ask your account manager. They send us an email and whatnot. But this guy is going to get decommissioned, so I'm going to leave him out. So I'll go ahead and select the whole group, and I'm going to deselect him. And then go ahead down into network devices. These are all good. We'll add all of them. And VMware, and we want to add our vCenter. That's it. Now, VMHSA1 and SA2, these are both ESX hosts. So like I said, you know, we, we, uh, we were gonna connect, we're gonna see that there's a port there. My credentials for vSphere are different from my ESX host credentials, so that's why we get this failed error. But remember, here we're trying to add a vCenter. So SAVC1 is my vCenter1, so that's what I really wanna add anyway. So we'll go ahead and click Add, and then Uptime is gonna go ahead and just grind through all these. It'll start off with your WMI agent list, and you can see that actually happening as it gets added into Uptime. Next will be our agent machines, then on to the network devices and vCenter. All right, now that the process is complete, go ahead and click our Next button, and we're going to start adding service monitors. So this is the kind of newness in 7.7, .7 and on is not only this better ability to add devices, but also to kind of start out with some monitoring in general for those devices that we've added. So there's quite a few that we've actually included in the product. Some for Windows servers, some for Linux servers, and then across different technologies like MySQL, MSQL, and Active Directory. In this first screen, we'll have the ability to modify any groups that these service monitors are going to be applied to. Though I would suggest that you just leave the defaults. We've picked operating systems to be monitored by the operating systems that belong in them. So it's pretty sensible. MySQL checks and MSQL checks and Active Directory don't have any groups home to them because we wouldn't want to make any assumptions that you'd have Active Directory running on every single Windows server or you would have MySQL on every Linux server and so forth. So again, feel free to just leave this section alone. And then on the next section, we have the ability to tell uptime what we want in those groups for monitoring. So if, for instance, your performance check is gonna be things like CPU, memory, and disk. Your file system capacity is going to monitor the capacity of your file systems. Surprise, surprise. So I'm just gonna go ahead and leave these all alone so I can show you what it's gonna look like when we go and run through it. So we'll hit next here. And there's a few of these, so get ready for, for a few minutes. Maybe grab uh, your favorite cup of tea. So MySQL query test, what this is going to do is check to make sure we can actually run a query against MySQL's database engine. 
Now this is a very handy response to have logged for future use and to put into graphs so you can understand how MySQL Server is performing from a very base standpoint. Notice I say base because select one is in our query. This is simply asking MySQL to say one which really shouldn't take very long, hence our defaults of 100 milliseconds being warning and 500 milliseconds being critical. Now you may find you have some noise depending upon your network, you know, and how long this stuff takes to respond, but generally speaking, very low numbers here would be very appropriate. So what this says up here is that MySQL Query Test 2 is going to be applied to the service group called MySQL Checks. Now port 3306 is your standard MySQL server port. If I were going to be monitoring uptime, I would use port 3308. So regardless, just make sure that you have the right stuff in these, and that goes for any of these service monitors. Port check will make sure that the port's actually listening, but honestly, if we can run the query, we're running the query and we're testing it. So really, uh, it's just kind of an extra thing that you could have in there. Username, I'm going to go ahead and use my uptime remote reports user. And because of, for this example, I'm going to be monitoring uptime, I'll go ahead and use its port. Uh, and by the way, reports, the password is reports. Okie dokie. So the match is what we're matching on. So this says, I'm expecting to see one come back from this query. And if you don't, then, well, MySQL is not working or you had the wrong credentials or something like that. So that's how this service monitor works. And many other similar ones will work the same way. All right. So now do we want to do this very often? Do we want to do this only on a semi-regular basis? That's what our timing settings are about. And these are settings that are, are actually shared across every single service monitor that we have. How often am I doing this? And what's cool about a time here is that we get complete control over how often we do what to any one particular thing or in a giant mass like this. So I might have one, I might have two, I might have a hundred MySQL instances all monitored through this one particular set of settings. Now, here, the default is uh, 60 seconds for our timeout and 10 minutes for our checking interval. Now, if you want that to be tighter, I like to have it a little bit tighter than that, I'll say five minutes, and that's gonna give me a little bit more granularity with my response time monitoring. Recheck interval is when we go into a warning or critical state. So let's say I go to check it, I go to run my select one, and it takes 700 milliseconds. Well, that, that's beyond 500, right? So that puts me into a critical state. Once I get into a non-OK state, we're entering what we call the recheck interval. So every one minute, up to three times, I'm going to run this again to see if that response time improves or maybe even gets worse. In the case that that happens, we're going to look at what we have for our alert settings and our action and alert profiles. So our alert settings, so notification. Yes, I want to, I want to tell somebody about this. What is the interval every 120 minutes? Now we try to be generous here. This is, if anything, is incredibly conservative. What this means is, let's say something goes wrong. You've got a critical alert. I'm only gonna tell you about it once every two hours. Now, if it goes okay, or it changes state, that's different. That's a change of state. We would let you know that so long as that state it changed to, critical warning recovery or unknown, is checked on one of these boxes. All right. So if you want to know about something more often, I would say change it, maybe 20 minutes. All right. And then every time we see something, it's going to be essentially an increment. We'll talk about alert profiles later on, but keep it in mind that we can create escalation paths. So perhaps we, you know, our first line responders, we tell them immediately, maybe we bubble it up to somebody else 20 minutes later, an hour later, or what have you. So I'm just going to leave these defaults in here. These are okay for me. Monitoring period is literally when we're watching this thing. So I would say from a database engine, I wanna watch it all the time. So that 24 seven fits this model quite well. Now there might be reasons why you'd monitor some things during certain hours or certain days of the week and not others, but the reality is from an alerting standpoint, we can monitor it all the time and only alert on it some of the time. That's again, that's up to you with how we, uh, how we do that in uptime. Now alert profiles are going to be how we get the word out. Uptime alert is packaged with uptime by default and is going to send an email to the email address you specified earlier on for the administrator of uptime. Anything beyond that, you need to edit this profile. Uptime alert is also used by default for all the host checks in uptime. So if I were to add a VM or you know an, an agent on a Linux machine or something like that in uptime or router switch, whatever, and we see we can't ping it anymore, we say this host is down, right? that's gonna use this alert profile and send an email to the administrator. 
action profiles are what are we doing about it, if anything. So besides just being a wonderful alert mechanism, uptime can act for you. If we see that a service goes down, perhaps we want to try to restart it. If it's in Windows or maybe even a process that's running out in Linux, we need to restart it or run some sort of script, some kind of action response to fix something or to have an alternate way to get the word out. Maybe we use SNMP trapping or we generate log file entries. These are all things that can be done with uptime, even running scripts locally or remotely. For this case, in this demo, we're just going to run through this. All right, next to MySQL Advanced Performance 1. What this is going to do is pull performance counters from MySQL. So performance counters are one of those things where there's probably only going to be a handful of things that you'd want to alert on and a lot more things that you want to actually collect data for, whether it's for forensic analysis later, right, or you want to have it on a graph perhaps so that you can understand how various metrics relate to each other over time or even as incidents unfold. So in this case, what I'm going to do is just go ahead and supply my uptime rocks password. We're going to connect this again to 3308. We're going to monitor our uptime MySQL databases. Um, now you, of course, do what you will, but I like to save all these for graphing, so I do have them to look at. And you'll notice that several of them actually have values under warning and critical. So uh, I would advise those are pretty decent numbers. There's not many of them, uh, you'll see, because there's really not a lot of these things that I'd want to alert on so much as just know about. So you know, if you feel comfortable with these defaults, it's fine. Just go ahead and click Next. Oh, and again, you know, timing, alert, actions, these are all the same thing. So since I've explained it already, I'm going to go ahead for brevity's sake and just skip over those. All right, next up is our Windows Server Performance Check. So this is going to make sure that our CPU doesn't get out of hand, that the disk queuing and busy times and so forth don't get uh, crazy. And then if they do, we have a, a mechanism to actually get the word out. So first of all, you know, notification's a big deal, right? right? So kind of one of the reasons why I want to do this is so I can send myself an email. So at this point, you might say, yes, I do want to put that uptime alert profile over here to send yourself an email whenever these things do become a problem. I would say from a trials perspective, we probably don't want to do that just yet. Know that because this is being applied to a group and applied to all your Windows servers, that this is something we can do once against all these servers. So there's really very little effort in the future to, to make up our minds whether we want to alert on it through an email or not. I would say since we're going to be spending quite a bit of time with uptime in its, in its infancy here, we're going to know what's going on in our environment, so it might be of less use to you to turn alerts on now. But again, it's completely up to the end user how you want to approach that. So here I'm good. Uh, sustained interval. So this is basically saying I need to have these things going on for this amount of time before I consider it to be problematic. This is generally okay because we're monitoring in a 10 minute interval. right? So I'm okay with all these defaults. They are they do come from Microsoft. They are sort of best practice, if you will. And there is no need to save these for graphing since these are metrics that are already collected as part of our platform performance gatherer. So really no point in saving those. I'll go ahead and just click Next here in this case. Next thing we're going to be presented with is the Windows File System Capacity Monitor. This is going to make sure we don't run out of space on any of our drives. By default, we're looking at all drives and considering 80% utilization a warning and 90% utilization of a critical stance. So we have the ability to exclude certain file systems, and you'll see that down here. Perhaps if we wanted like C drive or something like that, we want to change the warning level or just not have one. Maybe we want to have only a critical level at 95%. That's how we would do this. Right? Otherwise, it's going to be a generic setting across the board, and you'll figure out really where the noise is. But for this, I'm just going to leave this default. Next up, Active Directory Monitor. So what this is going to try to do, it's going to try to hit your domain controller and say, you know, what is this guy's SAM account name? Okay, because that's what the attribute that I have in here. Um, and how it knows to do that is basically through DNS, like finding that AD entry through DNS. But you do have to have it um, centrally applied to specific domain controllers. So what, what we've done for you is we say, you know, here's a name, it's going to this group called Active Directory Checks. And what you're going to want to do later on, and I'll show you, is go into that group and actually put your domain controllers in it. That is if you want to monitor Active Directory. If you don't care whether Active Directory authenticates or not, or you just don't want to mess with it, that's perfectly fine. But I'll show you what this looks like for now. 
So 389 is the port that's used for non-SSL communication in Active Directory. Unless you know you're using SSL, this is likely the port that your administrator uh, is using. Now for this particular user, which is my user AD test, I'll want to actually supply his password, and you can see that's actually right here, CN AD test. So we'll put his password in, his, her, whatever, ambiguous. Uh, your domain is actually uptime demo, and it is .com, which is already there on the end. So I'll just put in my domain here as well, uptime demo, and that is actually my AD test username, which is where that came from. All right, so response time on this, if it takes more than three seconds, uh, or sorry, two seconds, that's gonna be what we consider to be critical. I do wanna save this for graphing because I like to understand how AD performs throughout the day. All right, and again, all the other standard settings every 10 minutes and so forth. Next. Now we're gonna be doing our Windows service check for SQL Server. This is gonna make sure that the SQL Server service is actually running. So a little adjustment here. So if you're not using the default instance, remember this is a template for all SQL Server. So generally speaking, you're probably using the default instance. I've met many folks where they don't use the default instance ever. So if you know that's not the case, this will not be your service name, all right? This parentheses will be replaced by your instance name. So just check that, sanity check it, and make sure that's what you want. Probably is, but who knows. Service status, for this, I don't even bother with warning. I say critical is it when it does not match running. Because absolutely, if my SQL Server is online, then I need to have that service running for it to be a SQL Server. All right, I don't save this for graphing at all. In fact, I don't even save the response time because I purely use this for alerting, letting me know that my SQL Server is uh, no longer available, essentially. We're gonna do some other checks to it as well. So with that spirit, I'm gonna go ahead and slide my uptime alert over here and hit next. Next, we have the Microsoft SQL Query Test. This is much like the MySQL query test where we're going to test the performance of the query select one against our MS SQL Server databases. For here, we wanna make sure we use an account that has access to be able to do that. And so generally speaking, any account that has access to Microsoft SQL is going to have the ability to run select one using the master database. Basically, you're not asking for anything. You're just asking SQL Server to say one. So this should work in most cases, but you find out pretty quick if it doesn't. Um, in this case, I have provided my uptimedemo.com, my administrator, and the password there. Um, I don't use named instances, so I've left instance blank. If you do use named instances, just make sure you put the named instance in there. Again, since this is a master service monitor for a service group, you want to use whatever would be common across most servers to reduce your administrative overhead. So this should work for me. 1433 is my default port and I want to save that response time for future use. Now, 250, 500, these are probably pretty okay. We'll figure that out on later if it needs to be adjusted at all. Again, matching for one because it's select one. So much like the other one. All these other settings, I'm gonna leave default and go ahead and continue. Now we have MS SQL advanced metrics. And again, just like the MySQL advanced metrics, these advanced metrics are looking at performance counters that are coming from SQL Server. In this case, we're actually looking at the WMI counters available through some of the weight stats and some of the transaction information that's available through WMI. So this is by no means comprehensive list of performance counters for Microsoft SQL Server, but there's enough stuff in here to tell you whether the database engine is under strain or not. For those who may not know, wait stats in Microsoft SQL are a great way to understand whether SQL Server is feeling pain. So like average latch wait, wait time we include in here um, with kind of some Microsoft slash industry understood best practice. Generally, to say anything over about a quarter of a second or so is what you care about. Um, and the same goes really for lock wait times as well. Lock waits being basically, I'm waiting on this table lock to go away because there's some transaction running against it before I can run my transaction against it. So it just means that things are getting hung up a little bit, or maybe there's a, such a volume of traffic that the uh, the hangs that are there are actually causing a, a you know a line to form, if you will, behind the table. So definitely very indicative of performance. And then you know, like I said earlier, there's things that we're going to want to actually kind of chart, but not alert on. So I might want to look at 
you know, transactions per second, for instance, to let me understand if I have a high degree of transactional activity and a lock wait time that comes along with that, maybe it's just because I have a lot of transactional activity. Maybe there's something deeper. Either way, this is going to afford you the, enough data whether you know you should really get DBAs involved or maybe if they already are involved, you know, how much deeper do they need to get? Do they need to start analyzing query performance or what? So really within the spirit of uptime here. All right, I'll go ahead and just save all those things for graphing and hit next. Now we have our Linux server performance. So just the same thing as our Windows server performance. We're looking at CPU, memory, disk, queuing, et cetera, et cetera. The memory checks for this are going to be a little bit higher. We want our memory checks to, to be pretty high, actually, for Linux, because it's going to use most of the memory on a system. It'll find something to do with it, whether it's buffering or caching or whatever it might be. Uh, Linux, unlike Windows, does not just leave unused memory sitting around. So generally speaking, we're going to have pretty high thresholds for the memory bits in Linux. But the rest of it should be fine, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit Next here. Now we've got File System Capacity Check. Now, Linux definitely, on a typical install, has more file systems than your average Windows box, which would have C drive, right? Windows might have a logical volume management group, which you know might consist of, of multiple uh, you know, root, a swap, a boot, you know, and, and some other ones. So you, uh, you you can use this really to to kind of generically monitor the 80, 90 levels, right, to see whether things are running out of space. You'll be able to go and look at an individual, um, you know, Linux server and see what file systems you have, where they stand, and you can always come back for this service monitor on that particular server to add things into our special, you know, inclusion exclusion list and set specific values for them. So really here, all you need to do is hit next. And that's it. So we've got quite a bit of stuff done. I mean, we've added um, 15 servers via WMI agentless monitoring, six directly through an agent. We've added an entire vSphere, all of the ESX hosts and all the VMs underneath it, right? That are, are some of which are gonna be the same as, as these guys up here, but really quite a bit of inventory there and four different network devices and put monitoring across all of those servers, uh, obviously discounting network devices. We didn't do that yet. So we'll go ahead and click on our exit wi uh, wizard button. It's gonna dump you out to quote unquote, my portal. My portal is where you're going to go to find reports that you'll save for yourself to use later on and other things that you know might be related to your login and some links to documentation and things like that. Um, where I'm going to direct your attention right now is to the dashboard section. Now, um, so we've collected a little bit of data. There's uh, definitely some data points now. Some more still coming in from service monitors that are getting created and applied. But we can see you know, already there's some value coming through. Um, any point in time here, we can drill into these different groups, which are pretty basic right now since we haven't done any further organization. We're just getting what uh, uptime has already provided us. But if I go into, let's say, Windows servers, I wanted to see when, you know, what's been added to my Windows server group and what are their uh, you know, resource utilization and, and um, uh, service monitor statuses. You, know, you can see them all just listed out here. You can see you know, what has issues. I can sort by any of these columns. All right. And then really at any point in time um, from the grouping sections, I can look and click on any one of their statuses to see what that means. Like what is what are the actual alerts? Once I'm here, I'm looking at servers specifically. So for this guy, for instance, um, demo SharePoint 03, right? You can see that it has several things going on. I've got, you know, a disk that's almost full. I've got um, one critical alert, which most likely is my file system capacity alert. I can go ahead and click right in there and see that. Yep, it is file system capacity. Um, so, you know, there's really a lot of good we've already done as far as monitoring goes and getting things set up. I want to direct our attention back over to the infrastructure section at this point um, and show you what happens with VMware. Since, you know, we added VMware as well, how does the organization kind of pan out with VMware? We'll see that there's that SAVC1, that's my vCenter server. It's in the My Infrastructure group, in, in the kind of base of the My Infrastructure group. You see Solutions Group, which is my data center, uh, and just using VMware terminology here. SA Cluster is our cluster of ESX hosts. There's SA1, SA2, and then, of course, the resource pools that I have um, out in my vCenter. All right, and all the VMs are in there. Here, we're not going to do organization from this point. This is just to show you how things are sort of parented. If I want, I can ignore them. Ignoring them takes away from your license count, so it essentially returns the licenses back. I can also ignore entire uh, hosts as well by getting in there and, um, and actually viewing it and, and putting it into the ignored host list as well. 
So you might have some dev environments you don't care about monitoring. It's totally okay. We can ignore that and make sure that we don't get uh, um, essentially, you know, counted against us on the licensing front there. Um, now, just to kind of give you an idea how data flows through an uptime, you know, and I'll use VMware since it's kind of like the highest, the highest level up, if you will. Um, going to the view for that, or you can go directly to graph performance. Uh, we'll go over into the graphing section, and we can see information coming in from the highest level, right? So looking at our solutions group from a uh, data center summary, so CPU, memory, right, and seeing you know which what were the uh, like highest utilization um, things there, right? So you know what resource pools, what uh, data stores, and so on. And going down from that level into the ESX host level, we can look at a particular ESX host and see, you know, some vitals about it, right? What's running on it? How is it running? Uh, getting over to our graphing section over here, we can see what that looks like as far as resource utilization on the host overall, as well as what are the top consumers running on that particular ESX host. There's tons of reports over here on the left-hand side too, if you want to spin some of those up, you want to get into some more detail, or, you know, or even um, you know, look at things like power consumption on an ESX host. There's just tons of information that is available at really each and every level um, looking in VMware, right? So as far as monitoring goes, we also have um, things like availability and trends, outages. You know, we can see when we had problems on the various things that are underneath this particular host. You know, if it seems like one of your hosts is kind of flaky and we want to look to see, you know, does that cause outages on different VMs, you know, or things getting kind of kind of weird in there, you know, we can uh, do historical reports. And now I, I show you some of these, there's really not much to see right now since we really just spun up this environment. We're going to come back and do some more videos as well as some webcasts on how you can get further value out of uptime. But really what my goal was today was to kind of just walk you through the install, get you comfortable with how we're going to be adding devices and, you know, what it's going to look like once things get added into uh, your uptime install. Now, if you need to go spin up those auto discoveries later on, which you may if you're adding, you know, maybe different new vCenters or you're adding a different platform, you've gone and installed a bunch of agents or something like that, you want to go and find them. From the infrastructure tab up top, over on your left hand side, you'll find this auto discovery link. This is probably the easiest way to do that. We can also add things individually. If I'm trying to add, you know, specific host, uh, and it, we just do it by type basically. So maybe I want to add a specific um, host for monitoring, or if I want to add a you know specific uh, you know LPAR or something like that. You know, we can all always do that directly, just with the host name or IP. But we can run this auto discovery. It's slightly different than the one that we ran when we installed the software, but very similar in function. Now we'd pick you know something. Let's say if we want to discover network devices, we'd say discover. Uh, servers and network devices, go ahead and hit next, pick what it is we're trying to do. So, you know, exactly the same kind of mentality, right? We're doing network devices with SNMP. I want to use my global credentials to do it. Where do I want to look for it, right? And so this is just very much uh, like we had seen earlier where we're adding particular devices in a particular way. So, you know, whether it's one IP or multiple IPs, you know, it's up to you uh, what the scope is that you're going to scan for. All right, so there you have it. Uh, in the next videos to come, we're going to show you how to add more service monitors, how to get different technologies under our monitoring umbrella, how to build applications, and eventually even how to report on the SLAs of those applications.